Hello, and welcome back to Onward with Scott Chesney. Today's guest, Dr. Jill Weck, is a professor of medicine and rehabilitation medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital. She's also a VA research health science specialist and also a worldwide leader in autonomic research for people with spinal cord injury. Dr. Weck, how are you today? I'm good. Nice to see you, Scott. Nice to see you. Um, we're going to talk about regulating blood pressure today and everything else, but I thought we'd start at the very beginning. Autonomic nervous system. Uh, please tell us what it consists of, and then when one actually has a spinal cord injury, how is that affected? Sure. So the autonomic nervous system, as you know, controls many body functions, right? It, it's the, the, the idea of fight and flight or rest and digest. So the two components of the autonomic nervous system are the parasympathetic, which is really the rest and reject, digest portion of it, and the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight, right? So get up and run away from a bear attack or whatever. Um, so in a spinal cord injured individual, the sympathetic side of things are impaired because the spinal cord injury transects the spinal cord and the sympathetic nervous system travels from the brain down through the spinal cord and innervates, as I said, all the organ systems of the body. The parasympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, comes directly out of the brain stem, so above the spinal cord. So a spinal cord injury does not impact directly, we call it vagal nerve or parasympathetic uh, activation to the body. Now the parasympathetic side of things really helps with regulation of the heart. So heart rate, slows heart rate down. So if a bear attack we perceive to be a bear attack, it doesn't turn out to be frightful, then the parasympathetic nervous system will kick back in and calm us down. But the sympathetic side of things are what the spinal cord injury population lacks. So they don't have the ability to increase uh, cardiovascular function during say, say a, a bear attack or something more common would be like standing up or sitting up in their wheelchair every day. So that side of the autonomic nervous system is what's impaired and leads to low blood pressure chronically in individuals with spinal cord injury. So does that help? No, absolutely. Now, I know we, we've done a lot of research because uh, you've given many presentations too. You talk about the T6 area with regards to it being affected above that, but not necessarily below that if someone has an injury or an illness that has left them paralyzed below that. Can you explain that, please? Sure, sure. So it's important that we understand how the spinal cord injury and where it is in the cord and how that impacts the sympathetic side of the autonomic nervous system. And as you mentioned, T6 is an important level because above T6, from about T5 to T, uh, T1 to T5, there is direct innervation of the heart. Direct spinal cord um, innervation of the heart is impacted adversely. So in people with injury above that level, they can no longer adequately regulate heart rate. And that is a problem with the baroreceptor, which is a little bit more complex, but the baroreceptor actually is just a sensor, like barometric pressure in the air, right? Senses changes in pressure due to rain or not rain. Same thing in the body. The, the baroreceptors are pressure sensors that are innervated by both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system and respond to changes in blood pressure. So above T6, you can no longer adequately regulate the baroreceptors. So when you stand up and gravity pulls your blood down, the baroreceptors can no longer elicit the normal sympathetic response. So you have a fallen blood pressure and orthostatic hypotension. Do you find in your work, because th this is fascinating, we're gonna get into some of the symptoms that people experience that are directly related to blood pressure, but I'm gonna go out on a limb a little bit and say, unless you're going to visit the doctor, unless you're in rehabilitation, and unless like your doctor has necessarily told you to do so, most people aren't like taking their blood pressure. They're not checking on a daily basis, are they? No, they're not. And uh, unfortunately, that is a very common problem. I mean, I say it's a problem. I don't want to create a problem where there is not a problem, but people with spinal cord injury do not report symptoms. It's not just as people with spinal cord injury. We know that hypertension is, is known as the silent killer, right? So blood pressure is a problem, and it leads to a lot of downstream issues that people don't necessarily feel. Well, let's, let's with, talk about some of those symptoms because sure. again, a lot of people could say, well, it's because I didn't get a good night's sleep or it's because yeah. there's so much going on in the world, but tell us directly what blood pressure actually has to do with some of these symptoms that I'm sure many people out there are experiencing. 
Yeah, so blood, blood pressure is so important to the perfusion of vital organs, right? Like the heart and the lungs and the kidneys and the brain, right? And if you have a very low pressure system, it's like your hose. If your hose doesn't have a lot of pressure, you can't really water your garden very well. So what happens in a low pressure system is that you can't perfuse or you can't get blood flow to the brain because again, gravity is a player here on earth and as we stand up, or even if we sit up, gravity pulls everything down. So the brain is in our head, so it's up. And if gravity pulls everything down and we don't have the pressure in our system to keep the, the blood flow to the brain, the brain becomes low in perfusion. Now, what happens over time is people get used to it, but they feel tired, they feel malaise, lack of motivation. They may be cognitively a little slower than usual. And yes, a lot of people say no big deal, no big deal. I have, I have um, patients that I've seen who at, while they're eating a meal or after a meal can't really have a conversation because they just are too tired. The blood goes all to their gut to digest the food and they can't maintain blood flow to the brain to continue a conversation. And they say, no big deal. It's no big deal. I just, I just don't talk to my wife while I'm eating. <laughs> and that may be a good thing. I'm not saying it's one way or the other. But That's I'm a whole other that, show. <laughs> but it's a whole other show. We could probably do a better job of helping individuals with spinal cord injury recognize the symptoms that we can maybe help with either medication or spinal cord stimulation, which is our goal. So one of those issues too, and it, it's so interesting how you mention all these other symptoms because it, it it's something that people are just not aware of with right. regards to blood pressure regulation. So we, we want to regulate our blood pressure is that autonomic dysreflexia is something that the spinal cord injury community battles. And a lot of people battle on a, a weekly, on a monthly basis. Can you take us into the intricacies of that and what's taking place and maybe some recommendations on how we can avoid that if possible? Sure. So autonomic dysreflexia is unfortunately another common problem with people with spinal cord injury. And just briefly, it's basically an, a rapid elevation in blood pressure that occurs due to some stimulus that, that is instigated below the level of injury. So like a full bladder or a full bowel. Now you or I can sense those things and we can go relieve ourselves. That's what we do. The spinal cord injury population don't have that sensation of that full bladder, which is perfectly normal or full bowel. So what happens is there's a reflex arc that is autonomically driven because our autonomic nervous system controls in some part our bowel and our bladder um, function. That, that reflex keeps trying to tell the brain, hey, look, you got to relieve the bladder, I'm full. But that reflex doesn't ever get up to the brain because of the spinal cord injury. So it just continues in a circle and it continues elevating blood pressure. And unless you relieve the, the uh, instigating factor like the full bladder, it just continues and blood pressure rises. Now there are symptoms associated with that, which would be like a, a pounding headache, sometimes blurry vision, uh, goosebumps all over your body, um, uh, sweating in the head and the neck area where they can sweat. But again, a lot of people either don't have those symptoms or just accept it as routine part of, of who they are. So yeah, 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 I get a headache when, I, when my bladder is full, but no big deal, again, no big deal. But it is a big deal because over time, if you don't address that problem, then those surges in pressure, those surges in blood flow to the brain and to other vital organs really break down the vasculature and cause premature vascular aging, long-term cognitive deficits, and, and we believe contribute to the much higher prevalency of stroke in the population. Dr. White, I'm really going to put you on a spot here. Knowing what you know, and again, I know that you're not an SCI doctor or a physical therapist, but knowing what you know, if you had a spinal cord injury, injury whether it be uh, you were a quadriplegic or a paraplegic, what would you be doing, like almost like on a daily basis with, with regards to blood pressure regulation? Well, certainly you'd be monitoring it more regularly. I think that's the first and foremost thing that we are just not doing enough of clinically. And, you know, the problem is, and I appreciate that as a clinician, if you look for something, you're going to find it. If you look for a problem, you're more likely to find it. And that's hard because there's really not a lot that they can do to intervene that's going to help these individuals long-term and not worsen the pro problem. So if you see a lot of orthostatic hypotension, that is falls in blood pressure, and you treat with a current medication, you might worsen autonomic dysreflexia. If you treat autonomic dysreflexia, 
you might worsen orthostatic hypotension. So you've got this balance that you really have a hard time clinically currently today addressing. But I think first and foremost, I, if I were injured and my, and my patients, I do ask them to take their blood pressures more regularly. And if you look for it, you will see blood pressure instability. But once we identify that it's there, then we can work on the remedies, then we can work on the treatments and we can, we can potentially intervene and really improve not only their blood pressure, but their quality of life, their cognitive function, and really their engagement in everyday activities. What are some of those remedies that um, patients have shared with you that um, have you've identified, listen, you have an irregularity with regards to your blood pressure, um, and then all of a sudden they start trying something, whether it be something related to physical therapy, standing, whatever it may be, and you start to see some things possibly change. And again, I know there's not a, a one shoe fits all, but uh, what are some of those things that maybe you yourself might be doing if you had a spinal cord injury? Well, I mean, medications are only part of the picture. Um, obviously, prescribing a medication, being more fully aware of the symptoms of how they, how they are impacting their life, I think is part of it. Yes, physical activity, physical exercise, improving muscle strength, I think is another part of it. They can engage in physical activity. We do believe that that will contribute to better regulation, but it's not the total answer because they're not, they, they don't have an intact autonomic nervous system. So they're even all of the non-pharmacological, non, um, you know, uh, neural fixes are not going to be the answer. So I, I think, as you know, I'm very excited about the work of spinal cord stimulation because I think what spinal cord stimulation does and, and the little evidence that we have, which is really exciting, does suggest that it doesn't just treat the blood pressure problem, but it really restores intrinsic regulation by the autonomic nervous system. So you're not gonna just raise blood pressure like you would if you gave minadrin. And you're not going to just lower blood pressure if you give like nitroprusside, right? You're going to you're going to regulate. You're going to restore that autonomic integrity to really improve regulation of blood pressure during all conditions. And tell us now, because I know you've done a tremendous amount of research, and it'll lead us up to the work that Onward's doing as well. Is that how does electrical stimulation do that? How does it regulate blood pressure? Well, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, if we knew that, we, it would be a common clinical uh, intervention. We don't know exactly what it's doing, but we do believe that it's working on the, the preganglia of the sympathetic nervous system to, um, again, amplify neuronal signals that are coming from the brain. So we know that, the, that when you have a spinal cord injury, you're not completely transected, right? There is active and healthy neurons available. So what we believe is that the spinal cord stimulation targeted for blood pressure control actually just amplifies residual signals that are currently there. To, um, to It's like a hearing aid for your nervous system, right? So it magnifies the, the signal that's there. It's trying to activate properly, but it can't get through the cord because of the injury. So we think that it's basically boosting that to allow for a more normal regulation of blood pressure. And it doesn't happen, it does happen immediately with stimulation, but what's really intriguing is that we think there's neuroplasticity effects occurring that long-term, this, you really are restoring um, the endogenous function of the nervous system to more, again, appropriately and adequately regulate blood pressure. That's a great analogy to a hearing aid in terms of yeah. amplifying and getting the message out there. I, I, I love that. I have to uh, give a shout out to my colleague, Dr. Noam Harrell, because he, he's the one who uses that and it does, it rings true to a lot of people. Oh, yeah. he's trademarked that. I got it. You don't want to get in trouble there. I understand. I don't want to get in trouble. No, no, you understand. Yeah. No plagiarizing here. Yeah. So, so tell us when, so again, and you are the leader, you're the pioneer in autonomic uh, research and looking at uh, electrical stimulation of the spinal cord. When you heard about Onward and knowing full well that they were looking to bring these therapies, technology to market so that people could have them, people can work on them um, eventually at home and also in the clinics, what was your first reaction? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled to be, I think we're at a precipice. I really do think that we're at a, a, a tipping point where we're going to be able to, um, I mean, effectively change lives. That's, it's so huge. It's not, I mean, for me, I've been looking at autonomic nervous system. I always say, I'm like, Horton, here's a who, because I've been saying it's a problem. It's a problem. <laughs> no one's listening. <laughs> and now all of a sudden people care. 
And it's so important because it's, yes, it's not sexy. And no, people don't think about blood pressure. They think about walking, you know, they think about avoiding their bladder and their bowel. They think about sexual function, but they don't think about blood pressure. But, but if you take one half a step back, you recognize that blood pressure supports everything. So if we can improve blood pressure, potentially it's a gateway to really opening up a lot of functional recovery for these individuals. So I am thrilled that Onward is, you know, at that gate working toward that application, that indication for the, from the FDA to get this to market, to get it in people's hands, in the clinic, at home for more widespread use. And I think it, you know, it's a very exciting time to be doing what I'm doing finally after 25 years, but it's been a long haul. It's been a long haul. So there is yeah. uh, somewhat of a light at the end of the tunnel and I think you so, have yeah. helped to light that. So thank you so much on behalf of the spinal cord injured community. Uh, part of that spinal cord injured community, and here we are, uh, in April, which is Paralyzed Veterans Awareness Month, is that you've had um, uh, the pleasure, as you've noted uh, many times, of working with this uh, amazing population, men and women who have served our country, who are now battling paralysis. Um, what does that mean to you, um, Paralyzed Veterans Awareness Month, and with all the work that you've done with our veterans? Yeah, so I, 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 say, to, I say to my kids and my family, like, you know, I've been working with the veteran spinal cord population for over 20 years, since 1996. It is a privilege. I mean, I can't even begin to tell you how I, I mean, I know it's cliche, but I don't go to work. I go to help people. It's such a privilege to be working with individuals who are really, I mean, um, it's, it's, it, they're the best of the best. They've, they've given everything in some cases, right? And they don't ask. They're, they're really a truly humble and, and, um, and really worthy of our respect, that population of veterans with spinal cord injury and veterans in general. I mean, they've given a lot and they deserve our attention. And the fact that I can actually hopefully help them, it, it's really, it's been a, a very fulfilling, very, very fulfilling career for, like I said, over 20 years. Well, you're very humble in terms of being hopeful that you've helped them. We know that you've helped a lot of people who are veterans, who aren't veterans as well. So, uh, Dr. White, I want to thank you so much. If people want to reach you, if they want to contact you, because uh, you offer a lot and there's a, um, there's a lot that you continue to do to serve our population. If they had any questions they'd like to ask you, how is the best way to reach you? So it's um, J is in Jill, M is in Mary, and then my last name, Dot Wecht at va.gov. So I've been there. I'll be there hopefully for another, I don't know, 20 years, 25 years, knock on wood. <laughs> <laughs> and the lighter will be brighter. The light will be brighter as well. I hope so. I'm working toward it and we're working toward it. So that's great. It's really, it's, it's great to work with, you know, innovative and really cutting edge people with technologies that I don't have access to. So it's really, it's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And I know that we're going to talk again, but thanks for joining us today. All right, Scott, take care.